so loud. I don't want to do that to people for three years. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. I'm very, very happy to call this new meeting of the uh, Cascadian Poetry Fest to order. And I'd like to do so first by acknowledging that we're on the traditional lands of the Samish people, Tulela peoples, the Lummi peoples, the Swinomish peoples, and many others of our sisters and brothers of the Coast Salish. I'm Dr. Jason Work. I teach philosophy down at Seattle University. Uh, I'm also a uh, Soto Zen priest, and so Paul has asked me to do a Buddhist invocation, and so it's going to have a few parts, and I'll lead you through it. But the first part is a really, really important part, and that is today Sam Hamill would have been 76 years old. It's his birthday. And so, this belongs to Sam's practice. Come by! Come by! Come by! So, acknowledgement to his practice. Um, yeah, to Sam. To Sam! Sam. City of Anacortes Lodging Tax Fund, the Washington State Arts Commission, Ian Boyden, Cascadia College, Copper Canyon Press, Martina Spada, the Fidalgo Culture Foundation, Knox Gardner and Victor Zabnowski, Mario Sibri, How It Works for their printing of the bookmarks, posters, and overall support, Humanities Washington, Middle Point Press, Kim Miller uh, for support of the Samthology, Pleasure Boat Studio, Poets and Writers, Stanley and Risha Saber for the support to the Samthology, and the Subud International Cultural Association, without Subud, sine qua non, that without which not, they made this possible. So deep, deep Buddha bows to all of them. And uh, Paul asked me also to do some more traditional Zen sorts of invocations. <coughs> and so it's uh, part very traditional and part a little bit tailored for the occasion. So it's a, a mixture. And in the invocation, I'd like to stress two things. And I'll explain why. The first, we live in such extremely divisive times, with crazy divisive, manufactured division. Uh, but in Zen, when we go back to the well, we dig more deeply to a more primordial interconnection and being together. So the first part of the invocation was to be a minute of silence. People name the deep foundation that we all uh, share differently. Uh, name it how you will. We'll go into it. Uh, and then from there, I'll lead you to step two and the second theme. So just a minute of silence. momentarily into source, 
And the second part of the invocation, I'd like to call that source, source forth. I'd like to activate that source. I'd like to have that source energize us for success in all of our work in the next three days. And I'd like to do it also uh, by calling to mind something that I'm sure everyone saw this week on Monday. The United Nations released their latest report uh, indicating that a million species of life with whom we share this earth, a million, it's a lot, plants, birds, fish, animals, are at serious risk of extinction, already undergoing the greatest extinction in human history. And so it's a hard time to be alive on this earth with us. And I think we're going to try to go back to source and at least for our time together bring forth something more powerful and more generous and more compassionate. Uh, so this one's a little bit traditional, a little bit tailored for the occasion. The first thing I'm going to do is, some of you know how to do this already, but if you don't, I'll teach you how to make a traditional Soto Zen Gasho. Put your hand on your nose. So right there at your nose, about a fist length away. So this, we're yielding to everyone else, giving from ourselves. And so, the first thing I'll do is a traditional bowing. I'll ding the bell once, don't do anything, and then I'll start getting more, 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 stop, ding, bow and dasho, ding, bow and dasho, ding, bow and dasho, three times. Kamuke ka, let's say, hand. 
opened up the hand and give something in supplication. So this is uh, a supplication to our ancestors, to the spirits, to Sam, who came before us and gave us so much. <clears throat> Steve Cousisto, a poet, essayist, uh, memoirist, and translator, uh, rabble rouser, political activist, sometimes journalist. I got to know Sam by way of the old fashioned U.S. Postal Service. I uh, wrote to Sam many, many times between 1980, 82, and perhaps the late 1990s uh, about Kenneth Rexroth and about poetry and about what it meant to be alive. And we corresponded uh, back and forth and discovered that we were both very sad young people in our former lives. Uh, I was disabled and in high school and I decided to stop living. And I decided I'd do it the old fashioned way. I would just stop eating and I got all the way down to 96 pounds. Uh, and my family put me in a psychiatric institution. And it was there that I discovered the work of Kenneth Rexroth. 
And uh, so Sam and I had a lot to talk about. Uh, we thought of ourselves as sort of mutually orphaned in a complex way. And so in the mid-1990s, uh, at an odd period of my life where I was unemployed and uh, going from arts colony to arts colony, eating the sandwiches of benevolence, <laughs> I, uh, I wrote to Sam, I was almost 40, I said, I've got a book of poems, would you look at it? And he took it for Copper Canyon. And then we began meeting in real life, or outside of the post office, whatever. I'm uh, proud to say that uh, he was a tutelary figure for me, a good boon companion, uh, a sound mind and ear to engage with. I'm very moved to be here, absolutely uh, mindful that Sam would not want too much sentiment spilled all over the place. So I want to try not to do that. But all the same, of course, one's heart is full. I think I'll read a few recent poems. I have a new book coming on the way uh, called Old Horse, What is to be Done. This is called uh, Blind, I Bought a Horse. Blind, I bought a horse, not to ride, though some would. My wife, for instance. No, I bought him because of his loneliness. Orphic horse, retired from the track, left standing in a stall. Have I mentioned his neck? It's as long as Noah's hope for new sun. Il miglior fabro, I whispered to the greater maker. Just a little poetry illusion stuck in there. I can't help it. <laughs> I actually got Sam to laugh once. I said, you know, I don't care about Noam Chomsky. Uh, not his theories anyway. I like him politically, but I said, he just has no sense of humor. And I said, you know, the truth is, there are some original sentences that human beings spoke back in Kazakhstan or among the Essene tribes, but you know, these are the first sentences, right? And he said, well, what are those? And I said, well, the first sentence ever uttered by a human being aimed at another human being was, you go first. <laughs> That cracks Sam up. <laughs> I, have a, I have some others that, that right around that time in history, right? Poke it with a stick. <laughs> you taste it. <laughs> but I think you go first was the uh, very first complete sentence. You go first. I'll leave it to you with all the cloud forms. Men and women who resemble clouds. Children who pass through weather. Your book of life might say what people mean. I've only poetry with its rains or clearings until sun falls when we're unprepared. In this way, do I know you? Doesn't matter, nor will, as firmament is random. Down the street, a girl fashions a whistle from grass, and for a moment, She's the first person in history. I don't know why I called this poem this. These are all new poems. I don't know why I called this. It's called Third Poem of the Day. I don't know why. It's not a good title. <laughs> in the monastery at Venemo, that's in Finland, I took a sauna bath with a monk who said he was 100 years old. And in the steam, his skin smelled like strawberries. What do you like to eat, I asked. Strawberries. <laughs> Outside, the midnight sun went on making strawberries along the railway, down among weeds. One often thinks, what's a day for? 
What are the likes of which? Hands old or young, opened or closed, are not the answer. Another life is not the answer. The strawberry is not the answer. <clears throat> this is called sitting on a train watching a man with a hairpiece reading the evening paper. I don't know what he's thinking, what journeys he may have taken, what stars might shine for him as he reads. What remembered beauty hovers, if we're lucky, just behind the worst news, that clear palace of light we can still return to. Elegy. Washing birds is the work of the gods. They've been at it some 30,000 years. One may reasonably believe birds were not clean before rain gods came. I stand before a plate glass window drinking coffee from a paper cup. Many of my friends are gone. Leaves whirl under a street lamp, deaths butterflies. I have a hymn in mind called, I Must Be Home By Now. It could be me. Who told you what the wheat remembers cambered skies, two or three horses lost, so you'd profit knowing the ordinary course of life's growth, that thing we mustn't discuss after Newton, though I've hope offered shyly that dozens have shared their unshakable, dark, curling lift of thought inside of thought, which is sometimes sung. Hang on, as the Beatles used to say, hang on. I can make stuff so big on this iPad, it's like a billboard. And I can read it with one eye. Uh, a good friend of mine, Yara Golaina, a Finnish poet, passed away recently. I wrote this. Dear Yarko, now you're gone. I could transubstantiate, become an ethereal megaphone to tell and ask you things as we did in Helsinki, side by side, bundled in raincoats, scattered leaves flying. You said, death's butterflies. We both saw the cruelty of money on faces, the solitary pride of businessmen. The city is filled with hearts that have been condemned and torn down, I said, quoting Neruda. You said, can't build suburbs fast enough. It was fun being poets. And, uh, Sam loved dogs. And this is a poem I wrote to my first guide dog. I, I have written a book recently about her called Have Dog Will Travel, A Poet's Journey. And it's a memoir about traveling around the globe with this one guide dog. Uh, her name was Corky. And this is a poem uh, from my first Copper Canyon book called Guiding Eyes, dedicated to Corky, a yellow Labrador. It's been five years since I was paired with this dog, who in fact is more than a dog. She watches for me. Our twin minds go walking, and I suspect as we enter the subway on Lexington that we're a kind of centaur, 
or maybe two owls riding the shoulders of Minerva. The traffic squalls and plunges at Columbus Circle, seeds down Broadway, and we step out into the blackness that alarmed Pascal, the emptiness between stars. I suppose we're scarcely whole if I think on it. We walk on a dead branch, two moths still attached, the inert day poised above us, the walls of the canyon looming. Did I think on it? A blessing opens by degrees and I must walk both bodily and ghostly down Fifth Avenue, increasing my devotion full much to the postulate of arrival, to how I love this inexhaustible dog who leads me past jackhammers and the police barriers of New York. All day snow falls on the disorderly crowds. It clothes Miss Corky until her tawny fur carries the milky dirt of ocean and stone. The centaur gathers what passes from our flesh into the heart of animal faith. Meanwhile, she guides me home. So uh, the politics of the 20th century just bled over, no pun, into the, uh, the dread mass starvations and beatings of this century. This is a poem uh, in which I think I'm grappling with the fact that all poets tend toward a engagement with romanticism, no matter what tradition you come from. The idea that the poet is childlike in some degree. We have to protect those children inside us as well as the ones around us. This is called In Our Time. Who knows? I lie down on my side as though it's a necessary game, hearing the war drums, checking the corollary birds that betray the movements of spies. I'm hidden by the toothed, simple leaves of the English holly, and evergreen, it conceals us from public tragedies, has concealed us. Over the brim of trouble, poetry continues the yellow poplar does its damnedest to hide me. The alder drops red to purple in consecrated strings at the cemetery's edge. Who believes in the sublime infancies and virgin apprehensions of children among the sweet birches? I remain motionless like Thomas Traherne and listen for the bees from the estate of innocence. In the thick shade, the maple seeds rise like sparks just out of reach. I speak for the boy who, before all others, played our game. He played it while collecting twigs. He lay stock still on the earth and listened to the orient wind. The trees are foreign soldiers talking low in a different tongue. something funny because Sam was one of the funniest fucking people I know. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and I think this is this is this is this is the laughter that I think we need. So I, I, I fly a lot, right, with these seeing eye dogs, and uh, you just meet all kinds of people, right? You know. And uh, I went on a three-day trip, three different cities, and I met three different people who wanted to cure me. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, really. Right? Did it work? Oh. <laughs> When I finally got on my plane and settled Vidal, that was a prior guide dog, under my feet, I wondered about the miles that humanity walks uphill in search of a cure. It's strange enough to be a symbol for other people's curative longings, but it's odder still to be the figure of spiritual transference, as though in receiving Jesus, the disabled verify the faith of disheartened Christians. <laughs> my blindness represents a promise of rescue to others. I was mulling this over when I became aware that the man next to me was staring without saying hello. There was a vacant seat between us. He didn't think I knew he was examining me, but he was definitely looking my way, and Vidal, sensing this, put his head up on the empty seat. The dog's move would start the conversation. If you don't mind my asking, said the stranger, how did you go blind? I was born this way, I said and tried to calculate how many times I've been asked this question. I thought about it might work in reverse if I were to say, how did you become such a nondescript little nebbish in a cheap business suit? <laughs> but of course I did no such thing. It's easier to get out of the intrusive moment if you can remain monosyllabic. <laughs> oh, born that way, he said then, as if he were remarking about the ingredients in a French stew. Oh, ground goose livers in the cassoulet. <laughs> How unexpected. <laughs> Were your parents blind? <laughs> no, I said, not at first. <laughs> but, but now they are. Glaucoma, <laughs> asked the stranger. <laughs> no, death, I said. <laughs> My parents are dead. And as the ancient Greeks well knew, all dead people are blind. <laughs> oh, he said, you are a philosopher. <laughs> I saw this wasn't going well. I violated my monosyllable rule with a joke about dead people. I wondered what other mistakes I could now make. I could, for instance, tell him I was a writer. That would be a monumental blunder. The poet W.H. Auden once remarked that the best way he knew to end airplane conversation was to tell people he was a medieval historian. <laughs> yes, I said, I am a philosopher. Really, he said, as if he had discovered Spanish sausage in the cassoulet. And what do you do? I figured I should push a pawn. By day, he said, pausing for effect. I work for the airline as a systems analyst. Then he paused again. He was going to talk about Richard Rorty and post-analytic philosophy. I could feel it coming. <laughs> but in my own time, he said, pausing again, in my own time, I am a fire walker. Ah, I said, I'll bet you can't do that in the airport. <laughs> he leaned close then. His breath was heavy with garlic. Have you ever read the books of Carlos Castaneda? I wanted to stand up, make my way into the aisle, and kick myself for having given this guy room to clatter around in. I was now about to enter the occult landscape of peyote and volcanoes. I remembered a college classmate circa 1973 who once insisted he could get through college by reading only the works of Carlos Castaneda and smoking hash every day. <laughs> Carlos Castaneda, guru of the Grateful Dead, shamanic traveler who visited world after world beyond the scope of the human retina. God, I thought, how regrettable that I had made this airplane moment possible. <laughs> yes, I have read Carlos Castaneda, I said. Though not since the Nixon administration. <laughs> the stranger, who was now my stranger, looked at me fixedly, or so I presumed, since he wasn't moving and I could smell his breath. What do you know about fear? He asked. I knew it didn't matter what I said. Firewalker had found his stride. 
Fear is all around us, he said. Fear is in the air. You have it in your bloodstream. I nodded. <laughs> fear is what causes illness. All the major studies agree that fear, which the medical community likes to call stress, is the cause of illness. Yes, I said. It occurred to me that I'd never heard a single reputable study naming stress as the direct cause of disease, but this wasn't going to be a reality-based discussion. I can bring you to my ranch, where together we conquer fear. Fear is all around you, he said then. You are afraid, and I can help you. I nodded again. I've cured people with multiple sclerosis, he said. They put aside their fear and walk through fire. I've cured people of mental diseases, like schizophrenia. We walk 12 feet over the live coals, and then fear is gone, and once fear is gone, we enter a new world without pain. I'm not in pain, I said then, and was pleased to notice how convincing my voice sounded. I'm not in pain, and my blindness isn't remotely connected with fear, or abjection, or petit mal, or cosmic suffering. Oh, you can say that. But wait until you have walked through the flames, he said. <laughs> I knew better than to continue. I wasn't going to argue about the true facts associated with walking over coals. I knew that once wood is sufficiently burned, it acts as an insulator, that people can walk quickly over hot charcoal without feeling a thing. I read this in a magazine called The Skeptical Inquirer, <laughs> published by a group of scientists who travel the world debunking claims by occultists. I sank lower in my seat and said I had to sleep. You don't know what you're missing, said Firewalker. I was quiet, leaning on the pillow. I tucked against the far corner of my seat. When I got back home to Columbus, Ohio, my wife read aloud a short article from a suburban weekly newspaper. This references the earlier part of the chapter. This is the first person who wanted to cure me. The woman from the Holiday Inn who had offered to cure me as we stood beside the lobby waterfall in the Holiday Inn had been named Catholic Woman of the Year. The newspaper suggested without irony that she had cured people with disabilities in her congregation. My wife stopped reading and suggested helpfully that I forget about blindness and let this ministry cure the tendonitis in my right shoulder. <laughs> I thought of how three strangers had offered to cure me over the past 48 hours, and then I remembered these lines by the poet Marvin Bell. It's life that is hard. Waking, sleeping, eating, loving, working, and dying are easy. I knew then that I needed to wear Marvin's poem on a shirt whenever I'm knocking around in the public dark. Poets who go on and on. And now another one of my poems. <laughs> <laughs> and then have, they have to tell you a long story. So I'm very honored to be able to uh, introduce Rebecca Seiferle, who is going to follow me. She is a distinguished poet, translator, public intellectual, uh, a longtime friend of mine, uh, was uh, beloved by Sam. Uh, it's really a great honor to have her here uh, with us tonight. And then she will be followed by William Bill O'Daly, uh, who is, of course, uh, one of the co-founders of Copper Canyon Press with Sam and Tree Swenson, and is a remarkable poet in his own right, and also really the, the dean of uh, translators of the work of Pablo Neruda. And uh, it's a great privilege to have both of these poets here tonight. And what I'll really do now is sit down and get out of the way and let Rebecca read, and then she'll uh, just kind of, in a vatic way, uh, <laughs> call forward uh, William to uh, to read. So thank you very much. Well, Stephen, it is such a hard act to follow. <laughs> I have to say my one of the things that Sam gave me that was a great gift in my time as a person and its poet and a translator was his friendship 
but also the friendship of other true friends that I found and came to me through Sam. Yeah. And Stephen is one of them um, from the Port Townsend Writers Conference years ago. And he also mentioned Art from the Bell on the Town of Prairie Poetic Present that I was fortunate to own. And it's hard to account for such a gift that, in a sense, creates this whole world, mm -hmm. uh, this other sort of sense of the world that Sam was capable of creating. And sometimes it could be adventurous and funny. Uh, it was one time I spent a week with him in Asheville, North Carolina, mm. with Gregory Orr. And there was a festival, but principally what I remember is the three of us sitting around this huge house in the woods, having all these anguished and funny and um, sarcastic or classical political conversations and then going out every night to the same Japanese restaurant <laughs> that had the best unagi in North Carolina. <laughs> uh, so he had that kind of gift from the ordinary to the spiritual. For me, one of the hardest things about thinking about coming here was realizing that coming here, traveling this far, so on, that he wouldn't be here. That I would come this far and not actually see him. And yet he is here very much in terms of his presence um, in his house when um, all of my children knew Sam when they were like this big. And when um, he died, every one of them, though they are now adults with their own lives, in their in the 30s to their in the 20s, every one of them remembered Sam, but not as this sort of isolated figure, but as this creator for this reality for them. Mm -hmm. So every one of them said, oh, I thought of Sam and his house, his house in Port Townsend that he built it himself in the Japanese manner with his own hands, his bonsai trees. And many times he had us over there for dinner including my three kids who are about 85. Uh, and all of them remembered that as sort of this glimpse into some other kind of world or reality. Mm -hmm. For me, I think, I realized in a sense um, that Sam was leaving just a few days before I actually heard the news that he had traveled on. And I was in the park, and um, for some literary something or other, and we had gone to the tent, and there was this exhibition of um, Chinese artworks, painted scrolls, principally. So I was going through this exhibit and there was a pair of hanging scrolls, which was called Landscape and Couplet of Chinese Verse, Late 18th Century, by Aiki Taika. And when I looked at this little card that they have with our words, the poem that they had there was Sam's translation. And there was his name. And in that particular moment, at that particular time, it just stopped me. 
Hot does sort of sense of uh, uh, his great presence, mm -hmm. but also a sense of his past in the old world. So I'm going to start, in a sense, with uh, that book. Pair of Hanging Scrolls for Sam Hample. I'm not thinking of the mulberry tree. It's a process white with flowers, its branches emerging from its gnarled trunk that fall back toward the earth, or how the spring snow matched its delicacy before it melted it into the new crowns and left the tree standing in the snow of blossom. But if you said, how persistent, drunk star, with many other seasons, the new sapling sprouting upward as some spire of green to heaven emerges from its base, while its bark thickens and shifts. <clears throat> Not even the mulberry tree can hold your passing, so the pine wheels among uniforms of lodestone and north star, your presence to which I turn so often. Oh, now it's sparkling movement, unfixed, the night sky wheels into morning, the pot of coffee on the stove, the boiling water I pour into my love's cup. When they said you had loved, I left the brightly lit screen in the brightly lit house and went out into the dark to stand and silently bow to you and heaven, that clear light of the void. For the word is not only what persists, but what the word resists. You knew we are not so much lost in nature as nature is lost in us. Our cultivation of mental construction that tries to capture what it obeys. Oh, divine tree, where the three-legged sunbird was sent to reside, linking earth to eastern heaven, budding only when the risk of frost is past, thus Cultivating patience, its flesh made into paper, strips hung in branches as prayers, pulps to be made into vessels or a Shinto shrine, hanging scrolls or this bio luminous shrine of the water cup, where water falls forever fall. Even in sleeves bent to those silkworms, that spun the fabrics worn by the samurai and the rolling clouds, thus becoming a symbol of nurturing self-sacrifice, a kind of weapon deployed by human persistence, the first bow made by the Emperor Wan Di to kill the tiger that had treated him in a mulberry tree. And among all this, a single pilgrim, that man likely to be a poet of himself, climbed a tower mountain up in the almost impossible steepness. No, I cannot give you a mulberry tree, even if I change its arabesque to a process. It is itself, as you were, singular. Alone, whatever it was that made me stop and bow toward the silence, that moment, standing in the metropolitan and looking at Taika's panel painting from the Edo period, but not seeing the image at all, seeing all the up well. It sounds like Hopefully I'm going to say it won't be okay. Um, I consider myself fortunate to have just met him at the um, earlier before the great 
เพื่อเพิ่มวัดมันอะไรกันพอก็เลยเออตัวเองเดียวสังขาร virtual voice but even in human terms which are always those that are the most let's all take a moment to wish him well within ourselves to keep the spirit going with which we start I was telling Paul this reminds me of the early event with Sam Hamill at the Park House of the Friars Conference, where one of the readers and workshop teachers was the great poet Carol Tyson. And um, I don't know how many of you have ever saw Carol in the Free. But it was always a sort of uh, ultra-stylish, aristocratic performance. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Yeah. She got on stage. And she's up there reading her poems and what it looks like dress that she can wear to a New York album. And she collapses. And everyone just like this and ran towards the stage, including Sam, who was right there in the vicinity. Well, Carolyn insisted she was going to go home with the leaves. So she made them bring out a chair, she sat down in it, and she went through her whole evening. And then, promptly after the reading, was kind of pissed off was kind of concern. So I saw Sam later after this, and I said, what about Carolyn, is she all right? And he says, well, you know, Carolyn likes martinis. <laughs> and she gets nervous before the readings. So he said, the first thing her husband said when he ran up there rather slowly in comparison to the rest of us <laughs> was Carolyn. I told you you shouldn't have had three martinis <laughs> before the eating. <laughs> so, that's uh, a more humorous state of kind of sort of meant that uh, sometimes happen at poetry readings. Um, one of my favorite so for occurrences, when I was reading a poem in which I referenced the voice of God as kind of whispering buzz. And at that moment, in this quiet room, the announcement speakers went, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's like, I guess that's it. So, <laughs> uh, I think with this poem, if that happens now, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read the last section of the poem, which is about where I got interrupted um, by a fence. Uh, no, I should say, I mean, one of my problems is I sometimes uh, feel so much resistance to the point which we have. Why does it interrupt life? So there's a way in which I regret even framing it within that sort of language. Now, I cannot give you the whole very tree. Even if I change its air pass to a process, it is itself a super, singular, alone, whatever it was, that made me stop and bow toward the silence, that motion, standing at the tent and looking at Tyka's panel painting from the Eho period but not seeing the image at all, seeing only your name on the attending coat 
as if you stood there before me in your translation of people that one I published years ago when you were just crossing the yellow river, transfixed until only the mountain remained. What remains? Late in the afternoon, passing a hundred old cherry tree, bent low because its branches scraped my bowing head, and the angle of decline height revealing the bark torque by sinews of strength coursing through its trunk is. How it eludes us, the nature of things, resisting the nets the mind casts out to a heartless meaning from the air. O oh, fear and desire that makes of all it means a wrathful or a beautiful God. What persists is what persists, flying fearlessly and without desire into the clear light of the void. So, one of the great gifts of many Sam was also Kenny Cray and his wife. Uh, it was a wonderful person, uh, very gifted artist, had a great sense of humor, and was always sort of um, radical <laughs> in her sense of the truth. And this particular poem is for her. Uh, it goes back to a story that she told at that Port Johnson Writers' Conference when she was working on a fishing boat. The Avatar of Eminence. In the narrow straits of the sea to the north, in a narrow boat that channeled north, a woman cried for her lost son, not her own, but another woman. Her cry pierced the slate gray waters and her voice felt like a temple tumbling into the depths. She was mourning, too, in a quieter way, herself, her own son, now grown beyond her, able to navigate and captain himself through the shoals and barriers of that distant grief, for it was his friend who had died. The news that arrived for her only in his tone, so far away by second hand. All her cries were soliloquy as she moved through those isolated blockers, caught in the pants of the cell, on a deck in the middle of nowhere, still propelled by the tax of ordinary life, to pick up the fish, the look of the freight, the chores of money, the cost and the price, both going north in our heart like something called for butchering, tethered alongside. When out of the depths, a killer whale, its black and white cap hustling beside it, drew starboard and kept pace with the boat. As she wept, the whale rose to the surface with its mysterious eye and look at the woman. For thirty minutes, the whale swam with the boat. Cow and calf swam with her grief. And she was comforted by the gaze of that tiny eye, such a small self in a fluid mountain of love and presence, love like a depth of black and white, sounding a sea of gray. There were others later who scoffed at the story, believing whales incapable of empathy, the natural world devoid of mercy, or convinced only by accident or coincidence 
that perhaps the whale mistook her festival for another way, a strange metallic messenger of his own lost poem. And even the most sensitive poets would doubt that any whale would tune its fine sonar to the sound of human grief. But she would tell and tell the story. On countless occasions of looking to see, her dark wave of memory surging through the halls with a halting stammer and the crippled poem where at mercantile gatherings and in her buildings, retelling the story, trying to get her right, to tell it again to one soul of unmanly. For she chose those to whom she told them as the whale had chosen her. That act of preaching, of sympathetic correspondence, between herself and that Arctic world. And sometimes, one soul untrue, listening to her voice, her eyes closed to the mountain, drifting back to the plant with the water, the interruption of her cries, the rock of the boat, the fog erasing the horizon, but see, far often, gray world looking back in the living gaze of the whale. Singing. 
being oblique and awkward puking against the compounding of war. And I'm going to end with this last poem. The title of it is The Erotic is the Spark in the Tin Terror of Knowing. So this at one point was one of Sam's favorite quotes. It's from Kenneth Rexwell. <laughs> <laughs>
like a hen unto him the last, but on a dress before a false to the floor.